today we're going to talk about the BIS C. I've got the Renishaw Resolute 32 bit 50 nanometer linear BIS C encoder. So it's um, it's got a very reflective scale and uh, a little LED on there that turns blue when the power's on. That was very useful when I didn't have the 5 volt jumper installed. Um, there's a gap between the reed head and the reed surface and the absolute position is encoded. You could do this over a meter and uh, still get 32 bits of absolute position. It's incredible. Um, this is uh, bolted down to hold the gap and there's a bearing here on the slide. Um, I believe this device actually came from the Renishaw guys when they first released it to the US. It's a UK company. Um, I'm going to use an AEM Excelnet EtherCAT module today to read this single uh, this C encoder here. And um, just a couple of tricks for using the module. Um, oh, by the way, there's a guy that wanted to hook up 16 of these all in parallel. Um, there's a format for BIS-C in parallel, but it hasn't been implemented yet in the Renishaw. Uh, things, things may have changed, uh, so you know we should check on that. Um, we haven't implemented it in the drive yet, but we could. If it existed, we could do the network. Um, so the opportunity came for a guy that just wanted to read encoders over the EtherCAT. So this would be the lowest cost way to read encoders onto an EtherCAT network. Um, we do have multi-axis drives, so you can hook up multiple uh, BIS-C encoders. Um, but right now, I just have a single axis connected to the, uh, the motor connector here. So we'll take a look at how to wire this thing up first. So here's a typical data sheet for the Renishaw Resolute BIS-C linear encoder. Uh, it comes with instructions on how to mount it mechanically and uh, how to glue it down and tape it down. Um, it's got some good uh, diagrams of the outer shield, which should be connected to earth, and the inner shield, which goes to zero volt. And there's also some uh, distances you can run. There's compensation for long distances. That's the cool thing about this Renishaw. It's clocked out from the master and uh, sends back data. So uh, slave out, master plus, violet, yellow, pink, gray, plus five and ground. So the inner shield goes to zero volts and the outer shield goes to earth. Um, it's clocking data. And uh, we'll take a look at that in the Copley encoder guide for absolute and serial encoders. You can see the, um, the Copley outputs a clock on the X and X knot. Uh, the terminator is not necessary for that, but it doesn't seem to hurt anything. Um, so the master provides the clock, and the encoder slave reads back into the data, and it's received into the drive, and we got zero volts and ground. This shows a shield around the twisted pairs going to earth. I like the Renishaw better. Take the outer shield and go to earth or frame ground, and if there are inner shields also, take those and put those to the signal ground return. So looking at my AEM, I've got uh, X, X and X naught here on 8 and 9. And data and data naught in 14 and 15. I got a signal ground on 16 and a plus 5 volts on pin 17. There's a jumper which selects that. Actually, we do got to talk about the jumpers here real quick. Um, you need to remove jumpers F. It's unnecessary to have a terminating resistor when you're generating a clock. And the pull up, E, that's unnecessary. And the pull down, JP6A. Um, and then, of course, uh, to get 5 volts to the encoder, you have to put in the J4 jumper. So I'll show you where these are here on the device. So we've got the, uh, the J4 jumper. Is right here. You got to make sure that's installed between the lower two pins to get five volts from the module to the encoder. Otherwise, the light goes out or doesn't come on. 
And then here are the jumpers for JP1, starting at this side, you go A, B, C, D. I removed E, F, and G. I just moved them up so I don't, don't lose them, but those should be removed. And then JP6, A is the first one here. I removed that, and I just connected my encoder, uh, turned, the, turned the power on, and I got the light to come on. Um, if we're having any difficulty getting a signal, uh, you can check the clock from, from the drive. So looking on the X, you'll see a burst of uh, megahertz frequencies, which uh, you can determine if there's a clock signal. And then if there's a clock going out, you should get a data coming back. So as the position varies, you can see the count change. So there's the count change based on position. So clock out, position brings back the data. So I'm using the USB to RJ11 adapter to talk to this guy through the serial port. I got 24 volts hooked up, the encoder's hooked up. Nothing else, I'm just testing the encoder here. This is a, could be used for motion control or it could be a read only. But I've run the CME2 software and on the basic setup screen, uh, I've selected a linear load position primary. And I can, of course, use it in the passive mode just to read it over the network. That's fine. You could use it to close the loop if you want, but CME2 allows us to uh, set it up for passive listening, too. So this is a 50 nanometer or 0 0.05 micron, micrometer. It's a 32-bit BIS-C. Um, there's nothing I changed from the default. Uh, if you're using it to close the position loop on the drive, uh, you better select servo loop update rate because it's for position, so do it at the servo loop. But I'm just reading it, so I don't need to do this over the, uh, uh, I don't, you need to close the position in the drive. I'm just reading it over the network. So I can do that at the current loop update rate of 65 microseconds. Um, EtherCat's pretty fast, maybe 100 microseconds. So you get real, uh, real time encoder position from this. And then uh, if we say OK on this screen here, we should be able to monitor it just to make sure that we got some readings. So looking at the control panel. I can see the passive load position. So I'm down at one end with big counts, down at the other end with big counts. Um, if we wanted to do some homing on this, uh, we could put it in a position mode and affect the homing. So I just made some changes to the basic setup screen. I said it was on the motor, even though I don't have a motor. Put it in position mode and uh, had to go back and set it up a little differently. 32 bits, which is a lot of counts per rev. Um, you could do it linear too, just showing different ways to configure it if it was a rotary motor. And then we can look at the, um, the error log. Uh, there's no real faults in the drive, although I did see an encoder fault when I switched it over. Uh, if you unplug the encoder, you plug it back in. Never do this at home. That's called hot swapping. It's guaranteed to damage something. Oh, I got an encoder error. And uh, so feedback error. Uh, the encoder status tab usually provides more data. Um, it, it's just a pure encoder error. So we'll clear the faults here. And uh, we're back to Okay, so it's um, I changed it to position mode, active load position. So if it was closed in the position loop, uh, CME2 puts it in units of millimeters, which is kind of crazy for 50 nanometer resolution, but it's not counts anymore. It helps the user, I suppose, but um, uh, counts would have been better for me. Anyways, uh, there's the homing method which is uh, absolute immediate home. And I can offset by a certain number, 
three, six, oops, seven point three six seven seven. Uh, home at home offset cal. Oh, I got to make that a negative number. So do that again. There we go. So with the uh, homing screen, you can do absolute immediate home on power up, and it'll calibrate the encoder so that it's uh, if you power up at the zero end, you can see zero, and then at the positive end, it's uh, 206 millimeters from the zero position. And that happens uh, on a power up or reset, which allows you a method for calibrating your encoder for reading the active load position or the act actual passive uh, load position um, from the drive. So, uh, thanks for watching. Take care.